My father was a fisherman. He knew how to live off the land. I remember him getting ready to head out the door, getting ready to head out on a hunt, grabbing his gun, and me, small, wanting to go with him, wondering what we were going to eat next. He didn't tell a lot of stories, but he liked to sing. Some of my favorite memories were of him playing his guitar, singing away. He was tough, he worked hard, he built our house, new mechanics, was a jack of all trades. And we were always visiting others in our village. He was close with our family, and he took care of others just as much as he took care of us. When I was 17 and flipping through the channels, I seen my uncle on TV. It was mostly his face with the black screen behind him, and I remember being surprised, wondering what this was all about. He was talking about his time in an Indian residential school, how he was taken as a child, same as my aunties and uncles, including my father. He talked about how bad it got, that there was a lot of violence and a lot of abuse against the kids, and how much he missed his parents. When he talked about the abuse he experienced and seen, he cried. And years later, when he was finally able to go home, how he no longer understood the Nishka language and couldn't even talk with his own parents. Like most Canadians, I had limited opportunities to learn about this truth and this history. But here I was, looking at the TV, mind swirling, wondering what this meant. This is how I learned my father attended an Indian residential school. He had passed on a few years earlier and never mentioned anything about it. No one did. But a lot about my life and my father made sense afterwards. The violence, the drinking, the anger, how one night he jumped out of bed and kicked down the closet door, the result of a night terror. He carried a secret, this heavy burden, and I would never have the opportunity to talk to him about it. It also helped me understand why Indigenous peoples all over Canada were dealing with similar states of mass post-traumatic stress compounded with 150 years of government oppression and the intergenerational experiences of living in communities where no healing and limited truth exists. The last residential school closed in 1996 and only today are we starting to talk about reconciliation, which is understanding the history and impact of these residential schools recognizing the harms and human rights abuses against First Nations, and looking at how we can move forward together. Reconciliation, this long-term effort to heal from the past. It's a big part of my life, personally and professionally, but we still don't have societal consciousness on what reconciliation means. And given what we are doing, I'm not sure we will. In 2007, Canada's largest class action lawsuit, the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement, recognized the damage caused through residential schools and that Canada start to repair these harms through individual payments and the creation of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. From 2009 to 2015, the TRC's mandate was to collect stories of residential school survivors and ensure Canadians were informed of what happened in these schools. And for one powerful week in 2013, the TRC came to Vancouver. Part of the event had survivors tell their stories publicly. They were given 20 minutes to do so. I remember being in the audience, the air that smelled like burning sweetgrass, listening to survivors' accounts of the horrors they endured, as well as the extreme sadness they felt in those residential schools. And one story really stands out for me. It was a father and a son. They decided to share the 20 minutes to tell their story together. First, the father spoke for 10 minutes. 
He talked about how he was ripped from his home, the darkness he felt in this new place, the isolation, the violence and sexual abuse experienced by the children there, and that it happened to him. His voice was strong. He talked about being raped and beaten again and again. He was just a child. When he finished, he was angry and he was shaking, and he passed the mic to his son, a man about my age, who then said, this is the first time I've ever heard my father talk about any of this. I felt like it could have been me up there. Hearing those stories was an awakening, and I finally understood why truth was the pathway to reconciliation. But not long after this, the TRC process ended. The conclusion of the TRC was a report with 94 calls to actions which would facilitate reconciliation for the mass atrocities caused by these government-sanctioned Indian residential schools. Then that was it. It was done. Out of the estimated 80,000 residential school survivors still alive today, 6,750 gave their testimony. An important feat for sure, but I still think about all the stories untold and the weight that would have on those individuals and their families. I think, what is the risk of continuing as a country and not having those stories told? What does that do to us as a country and our future history? I believe this is an incomplete process. Our truth and reconciliation moment is not done. There is another example in the world that we can look to. Germany is a country that has made reconciliation part of their national identity. At the end of World War II, German public opinion of their role in the Holocaust was of denial and deflection. It wasn't them personally or their country. It was the fault of the Third Reich. Over the following decades, the sentiment in Germany was not seen as favorable towards reconciliation efforts. But as the next generation, the next generation of these Germans came into power, came to understand this history, it was this voice, it was this next generation who recognized they did have a role to play. And through persistence, political will, and leadership, the ideas for restitution and strengthening relationships with the Jewish community were born and produce cultural institutions and economic certainty for Holocaust survivors, and more than that, what happened could be called doing the right thing. Each German Chancellor from 1949 to today has had the personal imperative to repay this deep moral debt in acknowledgement of the heavy burdens of World War II. By the end of 2016, more than 60 years after the war, Germany had provided over 73 billion euros in all forms of restitution, which continues to this day. Agreements and treaties have been signed between Germany and countries affected by the Holocaust. And this is to ensure that Germans today can continue to support and produce projects of significance in the area of arts, economic prosperity, youth leadership, just to name a few. Generations of Germans have since gone through an evolution of thought and action, and today's younger generation lives with reconciliation ingrained as part of their being. And you can see that with so many young Germans today who are willing to volunteer in countries that were harmed by the Nazis. And today, the German government still finds ways to deal with the impacts of the Nazis through repatriation of seized art through monitoring language used in German textbooks. Each new generation of Germans recognizes that there are new ways, that there are harms that were caused, and that reconciliation for this will never end, and that its meaning will change with time. And what is true is that they are acting on all fronts, monitoring the process and using all actions necessary. For them, 
Reconciliation is a process that never ends. Our identity, who we are becoming as Canadians, I feel we are forging a path of forgetting, not remembering, and not learning. We are at the cusp of our new national shame if we let this moment pass us by. We need to go back and finish what we started. Everyone knows where Auschwitz is, but only one in five Canadians can name the residential school in their hometown. Residential schools like St. Michael's and Alert Bay, where my father was sent, or St. Paul's in North Vancouver, or the Cecilia Jeffrey Indian Residential School, where Chani Renjak, a young Anishinaabe boy, was sent, and who died later escaping. And you can hear his story told by the late Gord Downey in the project The Secret Path. And if you're looking for a place to start learning, check out The Secret Path. Let's not forget that these harms went well beyond the residential schools, but extended to the destruction of our traditional government systems. Blankets, infected with smallpox, gifted to our communities. Destruction of ceremonial objects or having them stolen away to collections around the world. The forced containment onto small reserves, taking away our wealth, our languages, and so much more. There is little understanding of these atrocities and less on talk for justice and restitution. There are many, many actions that have taken place over the last 150 plus years. And we all need to know this, and you need to know whose lands these have always been. We need to understand the deep connection to this earth, and we need to learn from that knowledge. This country also needs to officially acknowledge Indigenous peoples as key founders of this country. It needs to get rid of the Indian Act, a tool used for cultural genocide. It's been around since the 1800s. It's still around today, and it shouldn't be. We are less on the path to reconciliation and understanding the work that should be done, and more on the path to burying our history further. If this history isn't a secret, why does it feel like one? I don't have all the answers. I feel like that's for all of us to figure out together. What I can leave you with is another example. New Zealand as a country is moving forward on their reconciliation journey as well. They are building a national identity that is rooted in Maori culture and language, and much of it stems from Maori activism in the late 1970s for New Zealand to promote their language. In 1987, Māori was recognized as an official language of that country. And many institutions have grown from this. And there are now a couple of generations that are benefiting from this national recognition and respect for Māori culture. Because of this, it can be said that a goal of the Māori peoples is for all New Zealanders, whether they're Indigenous or not, to have Māori pride. And you can see it, it's visible, from the architecture with Māori design, to Māori place names being recognized, to having significant representation in government, and incorporating the haka as a sports team tradition. This is identifying New Zealand as a unique place on earth. And they are moving forward together, co-creating a country and an identity that benefits all and connects everyone there to the land they share through Indigenous knowledge. This is what respectful and meaningful reconciliation can be. How we get from here to there requires us to not treat reconciliation as if it's a time-defined program. It should not have an expiration date. If we are going to move forward in an honest way, we need to act in remembrance, recognition, and respect. And if it takes forever, we should be okay with that. That would be a great Canadian value. Thank you.